Hello and welcome to your lecture. In this chapter, we're going to be covering chapter 11 in your book, and we're going to be talking about the book. <clears throat> so let's talk about what the primary role of blood actually is. It is a um, transportation mechanism. It is classified as a connective tissue due to the fact that it has cells as well as a matrix. The matrix of blood is plasma. It will transport gases and nutrients and waste. It also functions in, in the regulation of temperature, pH, water balance, and to serve as a protector due to the fact that it's also going to house and transport immune cells. When we look at the composition of blood, we do have red blood cells or erythrocytes. Then we are going to have white blood cells or leukocytes. And then we're also going to have platelets in there and plasma. I had already mentioned plasma. <clears throat> the solid components of blood are collectively referred to as formed elements, and they do include the erythrocytes, the leukocytes, and the platelets. The red blood cells will carry oxygen primarily to tissue and carbon dioxide away. The white blood cells, as we know, function in protection, and platelets help with clotting. The formed elements will make up approximately 45% of a whole blood sample, and then Plasma will comprise the other 55-ish percent. When we take a blood draw, okay, we will put the sampling in a centrifuge. When we do this, the formed elements will pull towards the bottom of the test tube or the capillary tube. This is because they weigh more. They have more density. And then the plasma will be the upper portion that will look yellowish. Between the uh, red portion at the bottom of the test tube and the plasma portion, there will be a thin layer. That thin layer is called the Buffy coat. The Buffy coat contains your white blood cells as well as some platelets. When we do this centrifuge separation, <clears throat> We are looking at that formed element part, okay, that the, the portion that settled to the bottom of the tube. And by looking at this, okay, looking at the portion of the total blood volume that is comprised primarily of red blood cells, which would be that portion in the tube at about 45%-ish, okay, um, we are evaluating someone's hematocrit. Now, you get this done on your blood tests when you go to a lab, you get blood taken, and they will usually do um, a CBC to find this stuff out. So hematocrit values should range from 42 to about 54% of a whole volume of blood. It varies in men and women. Dehydration can cause hematocrit to increase. Um, so any, really any situation uh, that we're going to have hemopoiesis, meaning the body wants to form more red blood cells because their carrying capacity of oxygen might have been decreased for whatever reason, um, we're going to see the hematocrit value change. If someone lives at high altitude, his or her hematocrit may increase to 60 to 65 percent. The physical properties of blood, it is thick. I think you know that. It makes up about 8% of your total body weight. Blood volume ranges between five to six liters in men and four to five liters in women, but it does depend on a ton more factors. Muscle mass, fitness level, 
etc. Blood is slightly salty with a sodium chloride concentration of about 0.9%. It, has, it should have a pH of between 7.35 and 7.45 and, and carries a pretty constant temperature of about 38 degrees Celsius or 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, when we're looking at our skin, okay, we're looking at our vessels, we can see veins, right? Because they look purpley or blue. And that tells us that it's carrying the oxygenated blood. Oxygen rich blood in the arteries will be brighter red. Blood is about five times more viscous than water. But this is due to the fact that blood has within it those formed elements, but also proteins within the plasma and electrolytes. The thickness of our blood is going to contribute to blood flow and resistance, which then will have an impact on blood pressure. So when we're talking about the plasma, it is that pale yellow fluid. It's mostly water, but it also has plasma proteins and electrolytes, nutrients, ions, gases, hormones, waste products, etc. The three types of proteins that we will see within the blood plasma and these are relevant for a plethora of reasons, okay, um, which we'll get into a little bit. Albumin is the, um, holds the largest weight, okay, in, in our plasma. 55 to 60% of the proteins within the plasma will be albumin. Albumin comes from the liver and helps regulate the osmotic pressure of the blood and the blood volume. So due to the size of these particles, it will help regulate the osmolarity of the blood itself, meaning um, how much water stays in the vessel. We also have globular proteins. This will account for 35 to 38% of the proteins in the plasma also stem from the liver. They'll help in blood clot formation, transportation of lipids and fat soluble vitamins. Then we have beta proteins also formed in the liver. They will transport lipids and fat soluble vitamins. We have gamma proteins, which are plasma cells. These will help fight infection and fibrinogen, which is only about four to 6% of the plasma proteins formed in the liver and aids in clot formation. So the um, one thing I want to point out here, uh, our antibodies float around in the plasma primarily. That's where they hang out after they're formed. And antibodies are the result of true immunity, which means the employment of uh, lymphocytes inspired by exposure. You need exposure to whatever, okay, so that the antibodies can be activated when they're seen again. So let's talk a little bit then about <clears throat> erythrocytes, red blood cells. Hopefully the word erythrocytes tell us or tell you um, about the composition of the word. These guys are the primary gas exchangers. They carry oxygen to every living cell in the body and carry carbon dioxide from tissues to lungs. These RBCs are the most abundant cells in the blood, numbering between four and six million per cubic millimeter. A cubic millimeter is so small that it's almost invisible to the naked eye. Now, when we look at the shape and the size of these guys, one thing that's really relevant is the shape of a red blood cell. It should be a biconcave disc. When we do that, when we make that little depression like an inner tube in the center of the cell, it delivers more surface area.
Keep in mind that red blood cells have no nucleus and only a few organelles. But they don't have mitochondria upon maturation, so they have to produce their ATP anaerobically, which is interesting, right? We talk about the Krebs cycle in all our cells, um, anything that has a mitochondria, without the mitochondria, these cuts can't do that. Also, a red blood cell only has a lifespan of about 120 days and it gets recycled. One of the most important attributes of a red blood cell is the presence of hemoglobin. And I think we know this, okay, hemoglobin is the functional part of the cell that does the gas exchange. 98% of oxygen and about 20% or 10 to 20% of carbon dioxide will attach to hemoglobin. Uh, as a result, hemoglobin is known as the binding site of the red blood cell. Now, a hemoglobin molecule is made of four globular proteins, tertiary structure, okay? And they have an iron molecule in the center. And these are the binding sites for the oxygen. So I've said the word erythropoiesis, I think. Uh, at least once in this lecture, and I've mentioned it before in others, erythropoiesis is regulated by the kidneys. When blood oxygen is detected to have dropped, it's called hypoxia. The kidneys will secrete a hormone called EPO. Erythropoietin stimulates stem cell production of the RBCs in the red bone marrow. The bone marrow. When the um, RBCs are produced, which by the way, to get to a mature cell, it takes about three to five days to get to maturity. And then that mature cell lasts about 120 days. So if your body requires oxygen right away, that may not happen, right? Or if it requires extra blood, it's gonna take a minute. So once the then oxygen levels rise, this detection is also carried out by the kidneys and then we can slow down the process. So iron, folic acid, B12 and protein are needed for RBC production as well as for red bone marrow. So red blood cells have an ability to bend, twist and turn, allowing them to fit into capillaries half their size. As RBCs age, the integrity of their plasma protein membranes deteriorate. Protein synthesis cannot occur because RBCs lack a nucleus and other necessary components. Eventually, the membranes will rupture and the fate of the RBC is sealed. So there's death by phagocytosis. Remember, phagocytosis is sort of that engulfing mechanism, the bulk transport mechanism whereby a cell will eat something Recycling of red blood cells also uh, comes from hemolysis or the rupture of that cell at around the end of their lifespan, unless they're programmed to do it sooner. So once they lyse or burst, then their hemoglobin molecules will be recycled as well. And this will involve the spleen, the liver, and the kidneys to do all this. The globin protein is further broken down into amino acids that are later used to make new proteins. The heme is broken down into iron and bilirubin, which is a waste product. Now it is this blood cell breakdown that delivers uh, urine and feces color. So when we get to white blood cells or leukocytes, okay, these are, again, these are produced also, they start out as the same stem cell in the bone marrow. Then from a, the process of differentiation, they're told what they wanna be when they grow up. So whatever the needs of the body are, we dictate what these cells get turned into. At any given time, the blood contains 4,300 to 10,000-ish white blood cells. Okay, so remember when I was describing the breakdown of 
whole blood in a test tube after centrifuge, okay? 45-ish percent at the bottom where your RBC is. Then you have the Buffy coat, which is 1%-ish of that whole uh, blood sampling. And then the other 55-ish percent is the plasma on the top. So understanding that your white blood cells are present, but they shouldn't be high. But we look at ratios, okay? The ratio of one BC for every 700 RBCs can be a bit misleading because WBCs can leave the blood, but the RBC cannot, which is cool. Okay, so what happens is the WBCs gets transported through the blood and then sent to different tissues. They can migrate into connective tissue. They can migrate into the you know, basement membranes of the skin or the layers of the skin. They can go to other lymphoid tissue. They can, um, wherever they need to go, they're recruited after, after they do a little maturation. Through a process called diapedesis, white blood cells, primarily neutrophils and cytokines, will pass through spaces in the capillary walls as they move from the blood to infection site and body tissues. So if we require a healing process um, to take place, the white blood cells within the bloodstream can escape the vascular system sort of through holes in the vessel wall. Okay, so just real quick. Okay, so we're talking about erythropoiesis. Okay, red blood cell formation or hemopoiesis. If we live at a higher altitude, okay, the consideration is that the partial pressure of oxygen is less, thereby, therefore, there may be the inspiration for the body to produce more blood cells so that it can increase its carrying capacity of oxygen. So when we live at higher altitudes, there will be a difference until there's an acclimation for them. Just put it on. <clears throat> so back to the white blood cells real quick, one thing I need to mention, okay? Well, actually a lot more I need to mention about them. <clears throat> The classification of leukocytes comes from primarily the shape of their nucleus. First of all, they're broken down into two categories, granulocytes or agranulocytes. In the granulocyte category, they have these little dots, okay? And you're only gonna know this if you stain them and put them on the slide. The little dots are little balls of chemicals that help them basically wage chemical war warfare on toxins as well as uh, other things in the area or invaders that they don't want there. And then the agranulocyte category, um, those are our monocytes and lymphocytes. And those guys uh, do not contain granules, hence the name. So some leukocytes, not all of them, will work by the operation of phagocytosis, meaning they do that in engulfing kind of thing. Again, they wrap around a particle or a pathogen or whatever and take care of it. So as we're classifying leukocytes, there's a very nice chart on page 353 in your book. So I'm just gonna briefly read through how they're classified one, what they fight. And this will be relevant, again, if you were to go to the hospital and get lab work done and they did a CBC and differential, what that's gonna measure are the different types of white blood cells on board, like an absolute count of them within the sampling, but then also a percentage of, and compare, you know, what do I have going on in my body according to that. So neutrophils are the most abundant type of white blood cell. They are one of our first responders and they tend to fight bacterial infections.
when we talk about eosinophils, okay, these, okay. Um, pay attention as we're going through here to the lobes as well. Notice the different shape of the, when I say lobes, lobes of the nucleus, okay? If they have lobes, okay, eosinophils, back to eosinophils. Eosinophils um, will stain a little bit differently. They're gonna look a little more pink, pinky. And you will have high levels of eosinophils if you have an allergy or a parasite on board. Now, a parasite doesn't necessarily have to be a worm. It could be a fungal infection, and you will see these cranked up. When we have basophils at play, now these guys, you should have low levels of these um, inspired to be produced. Hopefully, they're not there. These guys produce both heparin and histamine. Okay, so what that does is that if you have a wound or an injury or damage to tissue somewhere, these guys will migrate to the area. They will release chemicals that will inspire more blood flow to come into the area and reduce blood clotting. And they, they do play a part in part of our T cell response. When we talk about lymphocytes, these are our second most abundant white blood cell. So we have T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. T cells and B cells, okay, these are responsible for true immunity, okay? Natural killer cells are still part of what we call nonspecific resistance. T cells and B cells require exposure for us to produce antibodies and some type of quote unquote memory to the presence of a pathogen. Okay, and a pathogen is not only microbial, but it can be a toxin. Monocytes, these are our largest buggers. Okay, they are produced in the red bone marrow and move through the blood into body tissues and they primarily act as macrophages, which will eat or engulf or phagocytize microorganisms. Now, when we talk about thrombocytes, this is platelets. Thrombopoiesis is the production of platelets. And these guys are small cell fragments. Um, they are removed from the body by phagocytosis after uh, eight or nine days. The way they are derived is really cool. They are derived from a cell called a megakaryocyte, which kind of anchors, it's, it's a giant cell, which kind of anchors itself within uh, a vessel. And then the current blood flow kind of rips pieces of this cell's roots off and these become platelets. And then they are involved in the actual clotting process, which is very detailed. So there's a substance called thrombopoietin, which will regulate that platelet production. So hemostasis, look at the word hemostasis, constant blood, right? Static blood. Okay, this is not homeostasis. This is hemostasis. This is how do we not bleed to death? How do we keep blood in the vessels? So let's walk through how some of this works. So if there's uh, injury to the vessel wall, we're gonna have some things happen and go in a particular order, again, to maintain blood flow within the system. That is super important because your blood pressure, your cardiac output, is partially responsible or regulated by blood volume. So when the endothelial lining of a blood vessel gets injured, it will release what's called endothelin, a hormone that causes the blood vessel to constrict and spasm. This will help reduce blood loss at the injury site. Under normal circumstances, platelets do not stick. We produce something that helps platelets flowing through the blood not normally stick to the endothelial lining. But when it gets punctured, it's going to release this endothelin. When the, um, 
when this becomes exposed, then we're then we move on to the next step, which is platelet aggregation. This is where platelets will stick to collagen fibers and to the rough edges of the vessel wall. The platelets will act like a spackling compound to repair a hole or tear. And in addition, the platelets will release chemicals that maintain constriction of the vessel and attract more platelets to the damaged wall. After that, we have what's called platelet plug formation coagulation. This is the gathering of platelets that forms a small loose mass called a platelet plug at the site of the injury. To initiate coagulation, the injured blood vessel will release a chemical called tissue factor. Tissue factor will activate 11 different clotting factors of proteins in the blood. These activated clotting factors will produce prothrombin activator or PTA. In the presence of calcium ions, the platelet chemicals prothrombin is activated to form thrombin. Thrombin then will activate fibrinogen. Fibrinogen will, and in combination with thrombin, will produce fibrin. And we'll hear about fibrin uh, in other systems and processes within the body. So fibrin is a long, sticky thread-like protein fiber. <clears throat> the fibrin strands will weave in and around the plug, forming a strong, totally tightly woven mesh. The process can be compared to throwing a fishing net around the platelet plug or a spider web. It makes me think of the spider web. So all of these, <clears throat> excuse me, blood cells and platelets get trapped in the web. And then we have the continual formation and then the removal of all the debris. So step four in clotting is clot formation and then retraction. So red and white blood cells become trapped in that fibrin mesh, giving the blood clot a red color. When it's complete, which will take two to 15 minutes and the clot has formed, <clears throat> there will be a fibrin mesh in the place. The blood clot begins to retract or shrink in size. This process normally takes 30 to 60 minutes. As the blood clot retracts, platelets pull the fibrin threads together. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the factors that started the homeostasis sequence are rapidly inactivated to prevent excessive clotting. In addition, coagulation inhibitors are released to prevent further clot formation. Eventually, other chemicals <clears throat> cut the fibrin strands and dissolve the blood clot completely. The clot is dissolved by a process called fibrinolysis, which occurs when fibrin is broken down by enzymatic action of plasmin. <clears throat> so, hematopoiesis. I may have misspoke that in the first part of this lecture. Okay, hematopoiesis. This is how we form blood. As we talked about in each blood cell has a short lifespan. It takes about three to five days to form a mature cell and then it only lives for about 120 days where then it's recycled through the process of spleen, liver, kidneys. <clears throat> so within our red bone marrow, which is our, a large uh, hematopoietic tissue, we have the production of all of our blood cells. They start as the same stem cell and then they go further. <clears throat> okay, now let's talk through blood typing. Okay. In humans, we recognize three types, of, three blood types, four blood types, sorry. Okay, so A blood type is a dominant blood type, B is dominant, AB is co-dominant blood type, and O blood type is a recessive uh, trait. It's a recessive gene that's being expressed. <laughs> so depending, in this chart on this slide, knowing what the parents have, of course, will deliver us, you know, a, an, an idea then, knowing what's dominant, 
faux dominant and recessive, what's going to be expressed or has the potential to be expressed. Now, the relevance here in this grouping is the understanding of antigens and antibodies. First of all, both of these are proteins. <clears throat> antigens are on the surface of the red blood cell. You have antigen, other kinds of antigens on other cells that give you cell identification. That's something we, we touched on when we were talking through cells, okay? We have these glycoproteins, little flags that st stick up out of the cell membrane that give our cells what we call glycocalyx or like this identifier to, for us or for our cells to be able to identify something that's a cell or something that's non-cell. Antibodies <clears throat> then, again, are proteins produced by true immunity floating around in the plasma. That become produced in the presence of foreign cells. And they bind to cells that have antigens that are different from those in a host body. So antigens are on the cell surface and then antibodies float around. Now, you can't have an antibody ready to fight something that is of the cell. So you can't have an, an antibody in the plasma that's gonna fight an antigen on a cell surface or that's gonna create problems, which when we're blood typing, this is kind of the whole entire point, okay? So the blood type, that we are delivered. If you have an A blood type, you have A antigens on the surface of the cell. Now, because you have A antigens on your cell surface, you cannot have the antibodies against the A antigen floating in the plasma. Therefore, you would have anti-B antibodies floating in the plasma. This will give us an indicator of what types of blood we can receive and or donate. Now we've all heard about universal donors and recipients. Okay, we'll get there in a minute as I walk through it and then we'll go through what type of blood can be received by what type of group. So if you have a B blood type, that means you have B antigens on the surface of your red blood cells. That also indicates that you will not have anti-B antibodies circulating through the plasma, but you will have anti-A antibodies floating through your plasma. <clears throat> if you have a B blood type, that means you have both A and B antigens on the surface of your red blood cells. So in that case, you cannot have any antibodies to A or B floating in the surface. Thereby, a B blood type is determined as the universal recipient, because if you have an AB blood type, you have no antibodies to anything and you can receive whatever kind of blood, blood is available. Now, if you have an O blood type, you have, think of O for zero, you have no antigens on the surface of the blood cell. Therefore, you will have both anti-A and B antibodies floating in the plasma. O blood types are called universal donors because, because they have no antigen on their surface, they can't be attacked in a transfusion, right? It won't matter. Now, if someone gets the wrong blood type, that creates a severe response called an agglutination reaction. And it is where you have this antigen antibody complex form. The, the antibodies that are floating within the patient will attack the antigen that's been put in there. Now, what I wanna point out here is this is not that straightforward. If you have a blood transfusion, they make you wait because it goes really even beyond this and, uh, I would say they speculate why, but they don't have 100% why, and this is the best procedure to date that we have for this, okay? And it works fairly well most of the time. But there are factors beyond this that we cannot always regulate, dictate, or know that are there. 
or why a body would reject a certain type of blood that should, according to our understanding of the charting, should totally work. Now, if you have any gluten re glutenation reaction, if you can understand that, it congeals, okay? It solidifies, it makes clots. So that can create blockages. Hemolysis, uh, obviously of the donated blood, can result in kidney failure or death. Now, when we talk about the RH factor, uh, we went through the letter typing for the groups, okay? But then what about the negative and positive part? This is the RH classification. So the RH factor was originally discovered in the rhesus monkey, hence the acronym or abbreviation that it's an RH. <clears throat> if you have RH positive blood, like A pause, O pause, AB pause, okay? This means that you have present the RH factor on the surface of your blood. Uh, red blood cell. And also there are, even within the RH group, there are different ones within it. But to keep it simple for our purposes, if you're RH positive, that means you have this antigen on the surface of your red blood cell. If you are RH negative, that means you have no RH factor on the surface. So this becomes another consideration, okay? You have to make sure the positives and negatives match. So where we run into the primary problem with RH reactions beyond just general transfusion reactions, uh, you can have problems in pregnancy. Uh, women can be sensitized to the RH factor during pregnancy. Um, during their second pregnancy is usually when it matters. Antibodies can attack fetal RBCs, and then the baby will develop erythroblastosis fetalis, um, responding or resulting in pre and postnatal care. Uh, you can get the, the shot that you get is Rogan. Okay, so. How blood develops fetally, okay? <clears throat> At weeks three through eight of fetal development, hematopoiesis or the formation and development of blood cells occurs in collections of blood cells called blood islands in the yolk sac. These are large nucleated erythrocytes that are produced and a small number of monocytes, macrophages, and megakaryocytes are also formed. Then around week 12, the site of blood cell formation will shift from the blood islands, primarily then to the liver, with some formation occurring in the spleen and lymph nodes. At this stage, erythrocytes become adult type cells without a nucleus. During the fifth month of fetal development, the bone marrow will develop from the mesoderm layer of the embryo and becomes the main site of hematopoiesis. After birth and during early childhood, the majority of hematopoiesis occurs in the red bone marrow of long bones. As people age, it becomes limited to the bones in the pelvis, the vertebra, the ribs, sternum, skull, and proximal head of the femur and humerus. In adults, the red bone marrow produces all erythrocytes and most leukocytes, like I mentioned all de derived from that hemopoietic stem cell, which I mentioned, which is super cool. This is the picture. So this is what you have to understand. This is in your bone marrow. So the health of your bones, or what they are up to is super relevant for the health of your immune system and what is getting inspired to be produced. And the health of your immune system and the resources you have to fund that investment um, to build these cells and to keep them cranking and to keep them on board is super relevant in, um, in this process of hematopoiesis. Like it's not unidirectional and one will stimulate the other. It's a feedback loop. So they'll talk to each other is I guess what I'm trying to say. Okay, so here's our, what's called a, a pluripotent stem cell, PPAC, okay? Then they get differentiated. They get, this guy will get told what it wants to be when it grows up. It will either develop into what's called a myeloid stem cell and stay there within the bone marrow, 
or um, develop into what's called a lymphoid stem cell and migrate out. So the, let's go to the lymphoid stem cell. From this stem cell, okay, that guy's waiting to be told what to do. It's being produced. It will make what it needs to make. As things change in the body, this guy will change. So from that lymphoid stem cell, then lymphoblasts are created. That's a lymphocyte building cell. Anything with a B tells us we're building. The lymphoblast then will create either a T lymphocyte or a B lymphocyte. The T lymphocyte is the kind of lymphocyte that will head out toward the thymus gland, T for thymus, does most of our viral and cancer fighting. Not all, but a lot of it. These guys are pretty ruthless in their fight too, the way that they carry it out. So from then the thymus gland, this lymphocyte will head out to lymphoid tissue uh, and uh, lymph nodes uh, until it gets activated and sent out to do its job. The B lymphocytes will tend to um, hang out uh, B for bone marrow produced and then maybe hang out in the bone marrow a little bit longer. These guys are our antibody producers, okay? These, these are the, the ones that are responsible for that. So they require exposure in order to be formed so that if and when, it's more like a when, you come in contact with that pathogen, whether microbe or toxin or whatever, it's ready to fight. Now, let's then look at the, how that stem cell will differentiate into the myeloid stem cell. A myeloid stem cell, uh, will produce then a monoblast, which will produce a monocyte. It will produce a myeloblast, the megakaryoblast, and then the erythroblast. Erythroblast will eventually form into our erythrocytes. The megakaryoblast will make that megakaryocyte, which will then be responsible for the production of the platelets. That myeloblast will then be then produce. Uh, a granulocytes in the form of neutrophil, basophil, eosinophil. I already mentioned some of the classifications of leukocytes. Okay, you have your granulocytic category and your agranulocytic category. Granulocytes, little packets, you know, you can only tell, you know, that they have the packets really on. Um, under a microscope. The granulocytes are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Your A granulocytes are your lymphocytes and monocytes. So granular leukocytes will circulate in the blood for several hours. And generally, they're going to migrate into tissue. A granular monocytes will circulate for one to three days, then migrate into tissue. Lymphocytes will cycle back and forth from blood to lymph and uh, into the tissues. So some diseases and disorders we're going to notice within this system. Uh, anemia. This is... Um, characterized by a decreased concentration of your red blood cells, hemoglobin, or hematocrit. Due to decreased production or an increased destruction of RBCs. The big point with anemia is no matter the origin, and it doesn't mean that you're iron deficient. It depends, okay? Um, your oxygen carrying capacity, your blood is reduced due to the fact that you don't have enough red blood cells made. Now, if you have a B12 deficiency, Putting a plug in here for vitamin nutrients and B vitamins don't hang around, they get gobbled up. So you have to constantly replenish. B12 deficiency can either come from you're not getting it in your diet, you're not adjusting it and or absorbing it well, or you have what's called pernicious anemia. Well, it's all pernicious anemia, okay, but it can be true pernicious anemia comes from the lack of an enzyme in your stomach called uh, intrinsic factor. This is one of the risks of getting gastric bypass surgery. When they take sections of your stomach away, they're also taking away that ability to break down uh, B12. Um, abnormal 
blood counts, infection, clotting problems, immune system disorders, and blood cancers can all be detected through a CBC. And I've already mentioned some of that. So let's look at some. This is a nice chart for reference, okay? Are they static across the board? We would like them to be. But um, please note that not all labs operate on the same range system. And I'm not sure what dictates how they do that. Probably the testing procedure that they do. So you're gonna have uh, normal ranges listed, generally, not always, measured in um, units per liter. Okay, acquired anemia is just to touch on that for one second. If it is an iron deficiency anemia, again, there can be a bajillion reasons why you're not taking that into the formation of hemoglobin. Remember that heme group and that hemoglobin molecule, primary molecule in the center is iron, which binds oxygen. So if you don't have it, you can't make it. We can supplement for this. Um, you can look for foods rich in iron. Hopefully you're doing all of your downstream conversions, which I feel is like the biggest thing. You're probably getting it, but you're not converting well. And that takes, you know, multiple steps to figure out is it the stomach, is it the liver, where is the process going wrong? As far as supplements, um, I would encourage a whole food supplement. So you decrease uh, the occurrence of constipation. Acquired anemias or a plastic. This is rare, rare but serious, caused by the damage of the stem cell and the bone marrow. When the bone marrow stem cells are damaged, they can't produce uh, RBCs. There's a small number of blood cells that are manufactured in the bone marrow that have difficulty developing into mature red blood cells, resulting in aplastic anemia. Bone marrow stem cell damage may be caused by toxins, radiation diseases like hepatitis, Epstein-Barr virus, by the way, super common. I can almost guarantee you have it. Almost everybody does. HIV and other autoimmune disorders, cancer, and sometimes we just don't know why it's there. Okay, I've already talked about pernicious anemia. I want to point out here within anemias, there's a symptom shortness of breath. Because so just because you're short of breath does not mean you have a heart and or lung issue. It could be as simple as you need some iron or B12. Okay, an inherited type anemia is sickle cell anemia. And I think we've probably likely all touched on this. Okay, sickle cell anemia. Um, it's a genetic disorder where the red blood cell shape gets mutated into a sickle. So this not only creates a deficit in carrying capacity, but they get stuck, they get, and they're sticky. So they can create blockages. Generally, you get treated with a medication that keeps the at bay. So I want to point out here, though, too, um, if a person with sickle cell anemia, you know, goes into a situation where their body starts producing red blood cells, the chances of them having more problems will be higher. So meaning if they go into like intense exercise or they're at higher elevations where they're already going to be hypo, uh, hypoxemic, this is going to exacerbate everything. Then there's another type called um, thalassemia. This is Cooley's anemia. It's a limited ability to produce hemoglobin and RBCs. Therefore, they, they carry less oxygen. It requires frequent blood transfusion and chelation therapy. Uh, chelation therapy, by the way, is a procedure that removes metals, such as iron from the blood, Chelation therapy sometimes is essential for preventing organ damage and failure with, in patients with thalassemia. 
So jaundice, this is excessive bilirubin. This is typically converted to bile in the liver. It results from liver damage or from disease. We see it a lot in newborns. It's uh, an immature liver where there's a different RH antigen than the mother. Um, usually it's just put them in the sun, okay, or a sun lamp. So that's interesting, right? Real quick, I just want to touch on that. We can change the color of your skin and the way that your body is processing blood by rays of the sun or light waves, electromagnetic light spectrum. Just pretty cool. Okay, hemophilia. This is a disorder in which the blood doesn't clot properly. Um, so the clotting factors responsible for coagulation are missing. So there are 13 clotting factors that are involved in the process, and we discussed them a little bit. But people with hemophilia are lacking clotting factors, what are called eight uh, and nine. So polycythemia then, this is uh, when the bone marrow makes too many red blood cells. And we can find this out by looking at hematocrit levels. Um, phlebotomy, it can be used to reduce the number of RBCs and also aspirin therapy can bring this down. So intravascular clotting, this is when we have a thrombus, which is a clot. Okay, an embolus is a dislodged clot, just for some language clarity. So a cause, maybe a roughing of the endothelium, blood flowing too slowly, um, or risk factors, sitting for too long. We hear of, you know, like a pulmonary embolus, okay, in a pilot or someone on a really long flight where they've sat for way too long. They're not able to recirculate their blood. And then when they do move, they have created a thrombus, dislodged the clot, and now they're, you can die from that. Okay, so let's talk about cancers of the blood. So leukemia is cancer of the blood. It causes the bone marrow to produce abnormal cancerous white blood cells. These cancerous WBCs multiply uncontrollably and grow larger than normal WBCs, but they lack the infection fighting ability of normal ones. Cancerous white blood cells have a negative impact on bone marrow, which leads to the inability to create RBCs, white blood cells and platelets that work right. So really it's almost this just inert cell that's produced. It takes over and it's, it can't really do anything. So we can classify leukemia as either acute or chronic. Acute gets worse quickly while chronic progresses more slowly. So children with leukemia usually have acute leukemia. Adults may contract either acute or chronic, and there are four types of it. Two types are acute and two types are chronic. So acute lymphocytic leukemia or ALL is characterized by an overproduction of lymphocytes. ALL or acute myeloid leukemia develops when the bone marrow produces too many myeloblasts or immature WBCs. Uh, CLL or chronic lymphocytic leukemia, like acute lymphocytic leukemia, CLL is characterized by extremely high levels of lymphocytes. CML or chronic myeloid leukemia uh, it, the is where the bone marrow will manufacture too many granulocytes, meaning neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. So people with chronic leukemia may not experience any symptoms for long periods of time, but with acute leukemia, they feel bad. They feel sick, and that makes sense. Symptoms of both chronic and acute include weakness, fever, bone and joint pain, stomach swelling, and pain from an enlarged spleen or liver. People with leukemia also have frequent infections because their abnormal WBCs are unable to aid in the immune response. So we look at the CBC a lot when we're looking at this. Um, you can get chemo or radiation, stem cell transplant, but the prognosis is poor at this point. Multiple myeloma is a cancer of the plasma cell in the bone marrow where the plasma cells of a person with this disease divide many times, creating even more plasma cells that are cancerous. 
and these are called myelomas. Myeloma cells deposit in the bone marrow, forming tumors that can damage the bone. As a result, people with multiple myeloma are prone to bone fractures and bone pain, particularly in the back and ribs. Um, this would, other symptoms may include excess blood calcium, kidney damage, and frequent infections. It's treatable, multiple myeloma is. But it is the second most common.